We're now going to move on to the next set of questions and what I've called the strengthening super set of questions. We've already covered strengthening questions, which is a member in the set that contains the self. But there are other question types that also count as strengthening the argument. Okay, so here's one of them. This is the one we're going to do next. There are two other types, and uh, I'll tell you right now, they're necessary assumption, sufficient assumption, but don't worry about that. We'll cover those in more detail in later lessons. Here, this word pseudo is kind of weird, right? Maybe you've never seen this word before. It just means false. Technically, it means false. But really, here, what I'm trying to communicate with this is that it's not really a sufficient assumption, and the contrast will be made clear once we do sufficient assumption questions, but it's sort of like a sufficient assumption. In a lot of ways, it shares similarities with sufficient assumptions. And maybe the better analogy here is the way in which an MSS question, a most strongly supported question, is like a must-be true question is a way in which a PSA question, right, a PSA question is like a SA question, sufficient assumption question. There's something logically tight about these two question types, right? There's something like once you get the right answer here, once you supply the right assumption, the arguments become valid. There's no wiggle room. Whereas for MSS question, you know, it's like, yeah, the information mostly supports this, but maybe you can figure out some situations. There's like some tiny assumption. Similarly here, Okay, it's just not logically as tight, but it does share a lot of structural similarities to sufficient assumption. And let's let's talk about that now. Uh, so I want to talk about the theory of PSA, how it relates to strengthen. We'll start with the similarities, right? You recall from the strengthening questions, when the argument gives you a premise, a P1 say, and it gives you a conclusion, our job was to come up with another premise right, brand new premise, premise two, and they're supposed to work together to make the conclusion better, right? Meaning there's some interaction effect. Generally speaking, the question stems generally ask for this. Sometimes the question stem will deviate, but generally, you know, the question stem will say, which of the following strengthens the argument, meaning, you know, you got to have something going on between the two. They got to work together to, right, like this premise makes this premise better. It makes the support stronger. Every once upon a blue moon, they'll give you a uh, strengthening, you know, question. That's where the, the premise just like ignores this guy and just independently comes in. It's like, let me just get out of my way. Let me let me do this. Right? And there, the question stem will make it very clear that that's what they want. Right? The question stem instead of saying strengthening the argument, will say like, which one of the following statements most supports the uh, researcher's conclusion or hypothesis or something like that? Just directly targeting this, like ignoring the argument. Right, because the argument has to contain the premise. Anyway, that's a tangent. That's a uh, that doesn't happen very frequently. Generally speaking, they got to work together, right? And so for PSA, it's the same thing. That's the similarity. Like you supply something here, and together, right, it makes the existing premise more relevant to this conclusion. That's the similarity. The difference is how it makes the existing premise more relevant. For PSA questions, it's structural, right? It's like the premise the correct answer choice would typically say something like this, if P then C. Do you see how it like obviously it makes this now more relevant, like far more relevant to the conclusion? Because now not only do you have the premise, you have another premise that says if the premise is true, the conclusion is true. Well, then of course the conclusion is true now, right? You, you see what I mean when I say structure? It just fits like a puzzle piece. This is saying, give me some input, I'll give you some output. And this is the right input, which leads to the right output. So that's what the right answers tend to look like, okay? So the wrong answers also tend to, some of them anyway, tend to look like something. They tend to look like some weird, confused version of this, right? It's like, I'm trying to get a ticket from New York to San Francisco. And the wrong answer is like, oh, well, here's a ticket from San Francisco to New York. Uh, thanks, but no thanks. That's not where I'm trying to go, right? So the LSA writers understand that this logical confusion is very common. So they come up with trap answer choices, right? Like if you, the content is so similar, the content is all here. It's indistinguishable just based on content. What distinguishes this claim from this claim is of course the logic, right? The logic. If I need, you know, premise says, here's a cat. Well, conclusion says, therefore I have a mammal. What's missing? If something is a cat, then it's a mammal, or all cats are mammals, something like that. You don't need something like all mammals are cats. If you give me all mammals are cats and I say, oh, here's a cat, I actually don't know if I have a mammal because all mammals are cats. Nobody said all cats are mammals. D do you see what I mean? Like that's the 
logical error, which a lot of questions exploit. PSA questions exploit this logical error by giving you something like this in the wrong answer choice. You're going to have, well, once we get to flaw slash descriptive weakening questions, I'm going to refer to this error as the oldest mistake in the book, right? And you're going to have this error present in the stimulus, and you have to call out this error in the answer choices. But that's another day. That's for another day. For now, just keep in mind that you're going to be looking for something like that. Okay, so maybe this theory wasn't so bad. Maybe it sounded like it was kind of simple, but I think by now you've probably caught on that as simple sounding as the theory is, it gets a lot more complicated by the grammar, by the actual words when we encounter real LSAT questions. Right here, it's like abstracted away from all that dense English. The structure, I hope, makes sense, but you don't get to abstract away from the dense grammatical English that we encounter on the LSAT, and that's like at least half of the difficulty. So the best way to get better at this is just to look at some questions, and we're going to do that now.